Hello, everyone. We're excited for you to join us today for our uh, webinar around sustainability reporting for improved business performance. Um, this is John Hoekstra from here at Schneider Electric, and we've really been delighted by the amount of interest and attention this topic has gotten, I think more so some of the, the dynamic speakers we have lined up for today. So we really appreciate um, your attendance. We've got over 400 professionals in the sustainability space listening in today. Um, from around the world. So really looking forward to a exciting hour of, or maybe a little bit less for you, of, of dialogue um, from some leaders in, in the marketplace. Um, so my colleague Gabriel and I are really pleased to be joined by a couple of two dynamic speak leaders, really, in the sustainability space for some progressive global organizations. Uh, Letitia Webster is Senior Global Director of Sustainability at BF Corporation coming to us from San Francisco, I believe, today. Um, and, and VF, or, as many of you know, are, are known really for its iconic brands such as the North Face, Wrangler, Timberland Vans, plus a number of others. And Letitia, just having known her for a number of years, has a wealth of sustainability experience and environmental and social responsibility and really how all that ties to, to business performance. Um, and, and at VF, she really leads a diverse program <clears throat> across the brands um, in, in efforts to essentially advance their sustainability strategy. So she's got a lot of inter interesting perspectives, I know, to, to share with you today. And Romy Miltonberg, um, she manages ASIC, CSR, and Sustainability Group across the EMEA region, coming us, to us um, from just outside Amsterdam in, in the Netherlands. So ASICS is also a well-known global footwear and apparel products company. Um, with extensive reach to runners and athletes around the world. And we're also excited, having uh, worked with Romy as well, that she's here to share some of her experience and knowledge with you um, in this space. And I think we'll really dissect the topic of sustainability reporting and, and give you some perspective, both from Schneider's point of view and the point of view um, of these organizations just around it, its importance in today's um, world for um, sustainability and business strategy. So what we'll do is we'll talk a bit about um, the current landscape of just some things that we see going on, some recent developments, as well as just some factors that are driving the attention and, and likely why many of you are, are calling in today. And then Romy will go through a bit around some of the reporting experiences from ASICS and, and some really some unexpected benefits that, that she's uncovered and the organization has covered, uncovered as part of their program. Um, and then Letitia will talk a bit about how she really leverages sustainability data within her organization to help improve business performance, and then we'll have time certainly to interact with these experts through a, a Q&A type portion towards the, towards the end of our, our, our time here. Um, so hopefully it's fairly um, self-intuitive uh, or fairly intuitive, but just to orient, orient you quickly to um, your webinar screen, You'll see volume controls down in the bottom right-hand corner um, to turn it up or turn it down, um, as well as the opportunity to take it to kind of a full screen type of view. Um, and so it'll, it'll take up your, your computer monitor there. And then across the top, you'll see a few, a, a couple of different things. The key one I want you to, to pay attention to is the opportunity to ask a question. So we'll be accepting questions from the audience and then using those um, towards the end as we have some discussion. It will also be where you can kind of rate um, the, the webinar today. We always like to like Yelp or some sort of application like that, see how we're doing. So interested in your feedback there. And then you'll also see I'm going to uh, do some polling questions throughout that will be uh, fairly intuitive. will pop up on your screen. We'll ask you a question and use some of the audience feedback to guide um, a, a bit of the discussion. So kind of getting into it, why report? And I'm going to gloss over some of these metrics. It's probably statistics that you've seen out there or things that are really driving for your participation here today. But um, if you look at it, more than 50% of customers prefer sustainable brands. They've outpaced the market by 120% when you look at stock performance. Um, if you look at consumer respondents, you know, 86% or more said they would like the, more likely to trust a company that reports around corporate social responsibility results. And, you know, if you see the stat on the right there, over 90% or over 90% of the world's largest 250 companies publish corporate sustainability reports. So obviously this topic of sustainability and sustainability reporting is important um, to the marketplace. And that drumbeat has getting, been getting louder and louder um, over the, the course of the past couple of years. And one of the reasons is just transparency and corporate transparency around 
certainly financial metrics, um, but also these non-financial metrics when we start thinking about environmental impacts, social impacts, and um, other essence of, of really driving sustainability performance. This transparency of how organizations are operating, goals and targets that are being set, the progress against those metrics is really becoming the norm. So you can see just substantial growth, and this chart actually shows the year-by-year -year progression of voluntary adoption of GRI or Global Reporting Initiative reporting from companies. And for those of you unaware, GRI is a prominent sustainability um, standards disclosure that essentially specifies how companies ought to report against different sustainability metrics. But you can see that across uh, the world, there's just a, been a substantial growth in the volume of, of companies and organizations that are reporting against um, GRI metrics. So kind of with that, one of the first questions we had for you is, and I, I, I'll be surprised if the, 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 the results don't weigh heavily towards yes, but um, interested to, to understand is sustainability reporting, in your view, a priority for the organization? So this is just to kind of warm you up on these poll questions so you can see that coming um, um, onto your uh, web screen there. We've got uh, results continuing to come in. Um, so with that, we'll just go ahead and, and roll those results, Steve. So you can see that about 85% of you say, hey, yeah, sustainability reporting is um, important to, to my organization. And I think for the 15% of you that said it wasn't, you'll, you'll probably learn some things today that will, uh, I think, uh, incentivize some of that reporting for your organization. Um, so what we talk a lot about here at, at, at Schneider is how using sustainability reporting can help improve your business performance. Um, and so over on the right there, you see that 76% of CEOs that believe that embedding sustainability into their core business will help drive revenue growth and new opportunities. And from the, the seat that Gabriel and I sit, we see that really happening um, day after day of how folks are really starting to look at whether it's energy efficiency, water efficiency, um, how employee engagement and diversity and other um, productivity metrics are, are, are driving within organizations. A lot of these elements are really driving improved business performance. So whether it's identifying improved financial impacts, resource conservation opportunities, how just by managing sustainability measures can improve internal processes and governance of business strategies and programs, giving insight into new possible growth arenas, whether it's new products and services to be more sustainable, as well as predicting and managing risk like operating in water scarce regions or using raw materials that are susceptible to um, climate change impacts. There's a variety of different things where sustainability reporting, both internally and externally, can give organizations visibility um, into areas to, to improve their organization. And I think what's been interesting for us to see, and our speakers I think will, will comment on it as well, is that CFOs or that finance organization that is um, you know, traditionally a tough nut to crack at times when it comes to, to new ideas and, and new areas of focus. 74% of C CFOs believe that sustainability reporting contributes to long-term success. So there's this really increased openness to how non-financial results can couple with financial results in an integrated way to provide new information and um, just support for how sustainability can help um, improve business practices. And I think it, as we as we look at what's going on out there in the marketplace, you know, there's even how kind of outcomes of Paris and otherwise, really regulation is also helping drive some of this and, and some of the compliance. And, and Gabriel, I know that you had some some thoughts being there in, in Europe and really operating out of Paris and, and maybe some observations that you've seen of, of, of this, you know, in play, especially you know, on the European continent. Yes, uh, so thank you, John, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, so, yeah, basically, let's see how uh, a couple of uh, political decisions can uh, indirectly or directly affect, uh, uh, you know, why and how companies may report on uh, sustainability. So I'm sure you've all uh, been aware of uh, the COP21 discussions in Paris, um, which uh, ended up with a, a, a very important agreement. Um, which basically was an unanimous agreement uh, between uh, 195 countries setting a target to 
to reduce uh, greenhouse gases emissions uh, in order to limit the rise of temperatures well below 2 degrees. Um, so there are other important decisions that were made, uh, but what it means here uh, for companies and for sustainability reporting is that there is going to be increased pressure uh, for all actors of the economy in order to reduce greenhouse gases emissions. And this will only be achieved through measuring, monitoring, and reporting this emission. And that's what uh, part of sustainability reporting is, uh, is, is here for. Um, a second interesting uh, uh, example is the uh, Directive on Non-Financial Information Reporting, uh, which is a concrete example of, a, of the increasing legal pressure uh, for reporting in, in the European Union. Basically, uh, it requires large public interest entities uh, to, pub to uh, publish information on environmental, social, business ethics areas in uh, their annual management report. So it's, it's quite a big uh, move uh, towards integrating uh, sustainability reporting in the regulation at a European level, and uh, it will certainly drive uh, sustainability reporting in, uh, in the European Union. Um, so let's see the next slide, um, please. Yeah, so here we see, and as I've just explained with the, uh, with the uh, non-financial reporting directive, uh, we see that uh, in Europe it is highly driven by the regulation. But maybe, John, uh, you can tell us a little about the uh, other big region, regions and, uh, and, and, and the big drivers for uh, sustainability reporting. Yeah, and, and I think it will be interesting to, to see out of COP21 how some of this um, comes to bear in, in the U.S. and some of the Americas region, but a, a lot of it is still largely around where consumers are, are driving the landscape. And, and I'd expand it beyond consumers, and you may put investors into that, that category as well, but a lot of those um, groups are, are still, from an external standpoint, seeking um, transparency and clarity around how organizations um, here domestically in the U.S. are, are – um, working in that, and I, I know Letitia sees a, a bit of that as well. In the Asia-Pacific region, it's going to be, I think it'll follow largely similar suit as Europe, where new regulations are kind of quickly coming to bear, um, even in places like China and those locations that are going to drive just a bit more disclosure, likely starting around carbon and greenhouse gas emissions, and then, then migrating to, to other sources as well. I would put Australia in a similar camp as the Americas in may, maybe kind of a hybrid where there's certainly compliance regulations, but there's also a consumer and investor demographic taking root um, in, in Australia around um, better disclosure and clarity around that. So I think what becomes complex for global organizations is thinking about how do I manage to all of these regional differences but still look to standardize on, on kind of and harmonize on, on a global reporting program? Okay, thank you, John. So uh, now we've seen uh, uh, good examples of the, the, the key drivers for uh, sustainability reporting uh, in company. Um, let's look at how it works in reality. Um, and, uh, well, the, the, the main message of uh, this slide here is that it's quite complex. Indeed, uh, you see that there are uh, 2.5 thousand unique uh, metrics that corporations use for sustainability reporting, which is very high compared to uh, financial metrics. Um, but it is nonetheless important to manage these, as we've seen, for compliance reason. And also, uh, as we'll see in uh, the examples that will be uh, presented by uh, Romy and Letitia, uh, that it is uh, important for monitoring impacts, consumption, and uh, indirectly costs within the company. Um, so let's see now in the next slide um, what the top challenges for sustainability reporting are. Um, because we've seen that it is complex, but it's unfortunately not the only challenge. Um, so based on uh, our experience in supporting companies uh, on sustainability reporting, uh, we've listed what we think are uh, the top challenges for sustainability. Um, so first is companies don't know where to start. Uh, of course, they could start collecting data or 
defining what type of communication they want to come for, uh, come out with, or what stakeholders you should be communicating for. Um, so indeed, you, you see that a uh, sustainability reporting it does require some planning, some, some strategy, some organization and tools in order to, uh, um, you know, be able to fully address the question. Second challenge is uh, the evolving stakeholder requirements and reporting schemes. Um, well, basically, companies need to uh, really know how to identify what schemes are relevant and adapt to the evolutions of the schemes. As I was saying, the non-financial reporting directive in the, in the European Union will have some influence on the existing regulations in the different countries that are in place on sustainability reporting. Um, next challenge is uh, companies are unsure of what data sources uh, and streams they, could, uh, they need to measure. Um, basically, behind this challenge, the uh, problem for the companies is to be solving the, the, the following equation. Um, so what input of information do they need for a given output of reporting? And uh, yeah, given the complexity, the numerous sources of information, that can be uh, quite a, a, a challenge to address. Inaccuracy of data, incompleteness, um, of course that happens because as you, as you, as you all know, uh, sustainability reporting involves uh, information such as environmental, like energy, uh, greenhouse gases, emissions, waste, production, but also information on uh, social uh, aspects, HR. Uh, and so not all companies are mature on each of these, uh, uh, of these indicators, and they have to uh, figure out a way to, uh, to uh, well, deliver a nice and uh, relevant sustainability reporting with adapting to these uh, challenges. Um, then a key question around sustainability reporting is the return on investment. And behind that is what value can you get from reporting and how can you demonstrate in your company to your uh, management uh, that you actually are getting value from sustainability reporting. And for that, I think it's very important to be addressing all the aspects of reporting from compliance, monitoring, communication, uh, to risk management, operational excellence, and uh, well, when companies manage to really have this broad view on reporting, then they can have a good uh, um, uh, speech and value proposition on uh, their sustainability reporting. And then again, we're back to the complexity and uh, the large number of uh, data sources with the, uh, uh, with the last challenge on uh, the variety of databases and systems. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, now we'll see how, um, you know, it really works in practice with a couple of examples um, presented by uh, Romy Mittenberg for ASICS um, and uh, Leticia afterwards, who will talk about how they've uh, uh, managed to solve the challenge that we've seen and uh, deliver the sustainability reporting in their organization. So uh, thanks, Romy, for uh, presenting this example, and uh, let's start uh, for ASICS. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little about your role and uh, what is sustainability reporting for ASICS. Yes, okay, thank you. Well, um, as mentioned before, I'm based in Hofdorf, which is very close to Amsterdam, um, at ASICS Europe, which is the um, European regional sales and marketing office um, as a marketing and CSR, um, excuse me, CSR and sustainability manager here. I'm uh, responsible with my team for all matters related to sustainability within Europe, the Middle East and Africa. At the same time, I'm also part of our global CSR and sustainability division. So I work very close with my counterparts at our headquarters in Japan and also other regions on strategic direction, policy writing. And it is in this role that since 2014, I'm also responsible for our global sustainability reports. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some of our experiences um, on reporting. Um, I just mentioned it already. Uh, for those of you not familiar with our brand, we are um, originally a Japanese company. 
We are founded in 1949 in Kobe, Japan, and that's where still our global headquarters are based. Um, since then, yeah, we've become one of the bigger sports brands in the world. Um, we're listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, and reporting towards investor was initially, for us, a key motivation for the publication of our first um, sustainability report, which was more than 10 years ago. Initially, these reports covered mainly activities of our uh, corporation in Japan um, and more limited update on data and projects of the other global regions, uh, such as Europe and the US. And over time, the scope of our sustainability reports has expanded to really become uh, a truly global sustainability report as it is today. Um, and now it's covering data and performance updates of the entire Essex group and aiming for open and transparent uh, disclosure towards not only shareholders and investors, but also other important stakeholders such as authorities, uh, business partners, NGOs and others. Um, I think that covers all. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, thanks, Romy, for this introduction. And uh, so we see that uh, it's really key for your business and for a large variety of uh, stakeholders. So now could you please uh, tell us a bit about the, the challenges that you faced uh, in order to implement that? Yes, yeah, surely. Uh, and I think some of them are already mentioned in the slides before. Um, and, yeah, I think the big challenge for us was most of all, and sometimes it still is, the timely collection and consolidation of data. Um, as a global organization, um, data has to be collected from all parts of the organization. That means geographically, but also from different layers and teams in the organization. Uh, on some, you may have a central database. Uh, for others, uh, it means maybe compiling Excel files, sometimes even receiving from, from very local organizations copies of energy bills. Uh, it all has different metrics. They have to be converted into to global figures. And sometimes, yeah, you also want to report on things that may not have a very concrete uh, number attached to it. So it's more uh, descriptive ways of uh, collecting and reporting. Um, I think another challenge was also when moving to from a more locally a uh, Japanese-oriented report to a global report that you really want to find the right balance between global and regional priorities and highlights. Um, you want, of course, a report to be limited to a certain amount of pages. At the same time, you want all relevant information to be in there. And also, uh, it has to meet uh, a wide variety of readers. So uh, it has to be the right structure. It needs to be easy to, to, uh, to navigate around, and it has to have the right tone. So, um, yeah, I think that sums up some of our biggest challenges of moving towards a, a global report. Okay, thank you. That's a, that's a great example and a great illustration of the complexity and also the, uh, the, you know, the communication that has to be really adapted to the right stakeholders. So... Um, now we'd be interested to know how you actually achieved to uh, overcome these uh, challenges and uh, deliver uh, the, the reporting that you do at ASICS. Yeah. Well, I think um, our main starting point was uh, really take our CSR vision and corporate values um, and then see how these compare to external expectations um, and standards such as GRI. Um, I think that is really important, um, especially, yeah, you, you don't want to become a victim of reporting standards. Um, you want to be inclusive, you want everything to be there, but in the end, uh, I think it's also really important to, st to stay close to your corporate identity and to, to really wonder what it is that you want to share and why, uh, and what is important for your organization. Um, and also, I think partnering with the right external service providers was a big help for us. Um, 
they can help with uh, project management, uh, sometimes simply copywriting, finding the right tone of voice. Um, maybe as sustainability expert, we're sometimes so into the subject that it helps to have somebody external to translate that into a comprehensive message uh, for those who are not too familiar with the subject. Um, yeah, and those together, um, for us, it really brought an improved structure and visuals, uh, working with the right agency for that, um, and also uh, systems improvements and towards external validation of data. And I think on these last points, the implementation of resource advisor was for us a big improvement uh, because it facilitated the global collection of data. Uh, it prevents a lot of mistakes in, in filling out manual sheets and reports and um, yeah, I think these are our main strategies that we have executed over the, let's say, the past two, three years. Okay. Thanks, Romy. That's, uh, that's some great insight for the audience uh, and uh, especially on, you know, covering how you should use the standards in order to uh, support your reporting and not be really uh, too constrained by these. Um, yeah. Okay, so now let's see the uh, the results that you've achieved and these uh, unexpected benefits that uh, John was referring to. Yeah, well, I think what uh, last year for, for our team was a really nice uh, acknowledgement was the inclusion in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for the Asia Pacific region for the first time. Um, yeah, it really means that we're on the right track uh, and that our improved processes for sustainability reporting uh, are not only helping us to publish an annual sustainability report, but um, it also allows us to better use this information for, for other purposes and inquiries. And um, yeah, we see this uh, illustrated by the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, but also it has a trickle-down effect on uh, smaller um, sustainability ratings, investor evaluations, uh, also uh, more regional information requests. And I think for us, a good reporting process um, didn't only help on just the publication of a report, uh, and saving resources uh, when having that uh, in a good process. But it's, uh, it's really allowing us to internally also communicate a lot easier on the achievements that we've, um, we've made over the past years. Um, but by now also to recognize points for improvement. Um, if you compare um, the level of uh, transparency, maybe with the GRI standard, uh, yeah, you can really see gaps in your strategy, maybe certain things that you um, you need the right metrics in order to share a story better, um, and it's, it's, it's helping you to evaluate your strategy over time and um, all in all become a more open and transparent organization, not just for that one report, but really uh, as a company. Okay, thank you, Romy. Uh, that's really definitely a great acknowledgement of the performance and uh, a good incentive to uh, follow A6 example. And we uh, can only agree with you on the fact that uh, uh, reporting in sustainability is not only ticking the box of uh, various compliance schemes, but it's indeed a uh, strategic tool uh, to support uh, your sustainability and your business strategy. Okay. Um, so thanks very much for uh, uh, this uh, great example. So now, uh, second poll question. So we've been talking about the challenges of sustainability reporting. We've listed them to you. You've had some good illustrations. So now you can cast your votes because uh, we'd be really interested to know how it is in your company, in your own experience, um, and yeah, what uh, what challenges you you faced in sustainability reporting? So let's see how that goes. So at the moment, um, unsurprisingly, at the moment we have uh, forty-two percent of the votes. Um, 
for the last challenge, which is justifying the return on investment. And of course, we see that uh, sometimes it, it can be a little difficult uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to justify, but it, it is definitely there, as we've seen in the monitoring, in the, uh, the uh, risk management, in resource optimization. And, it, and this person is actually getting a little lower and uh, coming to a tie with uh, the precision and accuracy of the data being collected. Um, of course, this refers to uh, the complexity of uh, data streams and data sources and even indicators that we've been uh, referring to. So I'd say overall it's, uh, you know, we have a pretty well distributed um, uh, votes of uh, the four challenges, um, which show that, uh, well, I guess for each company and each situation, you have uh, you have big uh, challenges and different uh, uh, different uh, solutions to uh, come up with. So, um, yeah, Gabriel, it's uh, yeah. it, it's kind of like uh, it, once for for the audience, once you justify that ROI, then you've got a mess of data to manage and, and collect and, and kind of pull together. So, um, it, it, it further substantiates Romy some of the efforts that ASICS has and. and I know Letitia, as we kind of get into to your world as well, a couple of those sort, sorts of things were almost like the the progression that you took for for some of your reporting programs. So it's so it's interesting to to see. So, well, thanks for that perspective, Romy and and Letitia. So interested to kind of hear from your perspective as well as um, obviously leader of VF Sustainability Program. I know you've been on a on a journey over the past couple of years um, to to get a little bit of uh, deeper insights for VF and your organization around reporting. So, kind of, kind of interested to, to hear some of the perspectives you have on on the subject and topic. Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Loud and clear. Great. Well, good morning and good afternoon to all of you. Um, thanks to John and the Schneider team for including VF in the call. We're we're thrilled to participate and. Um, Hope um, you get any um, good tidbits out of this, and I'm always open for questions as well as we are going down this journey. Um, I think it's, it, it was interesting um, and to, to see the poll um, on ROI. Um, I report to the CFO, so that was probably one of the first questions I got asked um, was, was the ROI on the whole entire program? as well as on reporting and, and data collection. And so I'll try to kind of dive into that a little bit um, as, as I speak, but I'm, I'm very acutely aware of, of the challenges you guys face um, when thinking about the ROI on this. Um, and there's a lot of different angles you can take depending on, you know, your, your business preferences and, and how your leaders think about different investments and value add. Um, but a little bit, um, just quickly, I know um, John um, kind of mentioned who I was, but I've been with VF for over 15 years. I started at the North, at the North Face out in the Bay Area, um, and then I was asked to um, move to Greensboro, North Carolina, where our world headquarters is, to lead the corporate sustainability program in 2011. Um, when I started the program, it was truly a blank slate. It was kind of a whiteboard, especially from a data and reporting perspective. Um, we really didn't have any type of information around the types of data that we traditionally need to collect from a sustainability and responsibility perspective. We were doing a lot of good things um, around the business, but of course we weren't tracking them. They were rather ad hoc um, efforts. Um, and so my role was really to unite kind of our efforts across the brands and functions under one strategy and to truly be the, the catalyst for change. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the data and reporting um, and how they have played a part in this. So why don't we, um, yeah. So, um, so, so, so basically, um, you guys um, know, know or have heard of VF um, and our brands mostly, North Face, Timberland, Wrang, Wrangler, Lee, Seven. Um, and we also make uniforms. Um, there's not really a day that goes by you probably don't see some type, at least in the U.S., um, some type of VF uniform from um, firefighters to police to our customs. So if you visit the U.S., the customs agents are all wearing 
our products as well as um, Park Service um, and many, many others. BS is a 115-year-old company. Um, we have about um, 1,500 different facilities around the world. Um, we make over 550 million products um, annually, and we have about 60,000 associates globally. Um, the interesting thing about VF is um, about 25% of our products are manufactured in-house at 30 plus owned and operated um, factories. So that really um, kind of gives us a whole nother level of, of reporting and complexity to, um, to kind of the effort. Um, the VF is also a very methodical, measured and performance driven company. Um, and I knew if our program was going to be successful within VF and reporting to the CFO, it had to take that, that same approach. And we had to measure and report our progress um, more almost from an internal perspective than an external perspective. Um, we knew we needed to, in order to get credibility, um, to be trusted within the organization, to prove our worth, um, and the value um, reporting was absolutely fundamental to, to the success um, of just our culture and the way we do things, let alone the importance of being transparent, you know, to external stakeholders, obviously incredibly important um, to do that. Um, and I learned quickly, um, or, or figured out, I guess, quickly that one could drive the other and how to play um, kind of those two together to, to really move the program forward. And, and that was um, kind of a really interesting way um, of creating change. Um, and again, kind of being that catalyst for change, you have to think about what's in your toolbox um, for doing that. And I would say uh, data collection and reporting is, for us, was one of the most important pieces and one of the most important tools um, in, our, in our toolbox. Um, it's important to note that um, reporting was not the end goal, um, and it, it's obviously incredibly important, but for us it was the process of setting up the methodologies, the governance, and aligning enterprise around our key goals and metrics and, and data so that we can analyze and think about ways to improve our business. Um, from everything from how we operate um, our, our, our factories, our DCs, our retail stores, to the products um, that we make, um, and to our supply chain and our um, thousands of, of factories that make our goods. Um, one of the most important selling points for me um, coming into the organization um, was environmental waste is financial waste. and. Um, so I, I, I sold the program on that in the beginning, and um, and I really truly believe that, and, and, and I think it, it is truly the truth, is that typically organizations don't focus on, um, you know, energy use, um, material use, um, necessarily from like a marker efficiency or, or waste, um, and especially water, um, because, you know, mostly around the world, no one really, there's not a cost to it. So how could we begin to show that there were dollars literally being wasted um, and that we were able to capture that and improve our environmental impact? And that was one of the first ways that we approached this um, and one of the first ways we were able to show immediate ROI. Um, and it was from an energy perspective. And that was um, one of the most, um, I think, or, or the, one of the biggest opportunities to show, again, our value um, over the past, just on a side note, over the past um, five years, since we've been doing um, at least energy and carbon reporting, we've been able to save the company over $25 million. Um, and that's pretty significant even to um, a $13 billion company. Um, I think that the CFO and, and the company took notice and, and appreciated appreciated that. Um, yeah, so, perfect. Um, so when we think about um, reporting data, is it's king, right? Um, it's about the data. And we needed to first and foremost understand our baseline um, around carbon and energy and waste and water, materials, community service, and all of GRI data. 
um, around health and safety. Um, and we knew we needed to begin to determine kind of what was material to our business, where could we actually early on make some impact um, that, again, would build some trust, would get some momentum going, would create some quick wins, um, and get people excited about the program. Um, and so these dashboards now that we use with Schneider is incredibly helpful um, and, and critical in creating accountability and illustrating progress. Um, actually, right here, what you're looking at is, um, is, a, is a dashboard that talks about um, invoice completion around our energy and carbon data. And the reason that this is actually a really important slide is to illustrate that actually this is going to all of our internal audit teams. Um, so our regions across the world are actually starting to be held accountable for invoice completion. Invoice completion meaning energy invoices, um, natural gas invoices, all of that that has to be compiled to provide our carbon footprint every year to for CDP, as, as many of you guys know. We, in the beginning, um, uh, we've been reporting to CDP since 2011. It was a manual process in the first um, couple, first, I think, two years, um, which was just crazy with 1,500 different facilities. But once we got onto this system um, and, and, and got it up and running, we are now working, like I said, with our internal audit team, and they are now holding their own um, teams, regions, countries accountable for getting um, the invoices in. Um, and that was a really important piece um, as you guys think about reporting, is how do you start embedding this into current organizational practices um, so you aren't having to always introduce something completely new, but leveraging what is already kind of in the organization and what are the, all, the processes already going on. And that was a really big piece for us. And then since um, we report into the finance leadership team, and so does audit. That was a really important piece um, of, of getting our data in so we can have truly accurate data as we're going and publicly reporting this. And that was actually, last point on this slide, is, is what I was mentioning before, is how you leverage kind of the internal and external, is saying, if we're going to publicly state goals, if we're going to publicly report on this information, then we have to have the systems in place to ensure that it's credible and trustworthy, it's auditable, there's assurance around it. And so leveraging, again, kind of that financial um, methodology was really important, and that's really what got the organization kind of saying, okay, I understand why this is so important and why you need to invest in it. So we'll go to the next slide. So um, the first thing that we did when we brought Shiner on was to help streamline our energy and carbon data, um, and, you, and you saw kind of some of the dashboards there. Um, but that wasn't enough. Um, we really needed to understand what was going on across our organization. And again, we have about 1,500 different facilities, over 30 manufacturing sites, and almost 40 distribution centers, about um, 1,300 retail stores, plus showrooms and offices. Many of you guys have probably a similar footprint. Um, but it was really impossible to understand what in the world was going on. And so we challenged Schneider to help us think about how do we survey our facilities to begin to understand what are some best practices out there, what are some opportunities for improvement, um, and most importantly, just let's get a benchmark going um, across our facilities. Let's understand what we're doing so we can start to set some goals um, and we can start to share some stuff around the organization. And so we created what we call our scorecard. Um, it's really, to be honest, it's a survey function that goes out on an annual basis um, and asks a whole plethora of questions um, to each of our facilities, um, like you see around energy and water and waste, community service. Um, it's translated into seven different languages. Um, and then it's aggregated up um, into, you know, a report card. Um, so we ask that um, we try and get, our goal is to try and get about 95% completion rate 
on this. Um, and we're, we're getting there. We're at about, I think, 80, I think 89% or 88% is where we are right now. So it, it's pretty good. And what we're doing now, actually, and actually, why don't you jump to the next um, slide? Perfect. So what we're doing now is, you'll see on the right, is we're actually creating these dashboards, which are really kind of the report card for our brands and our key functions. So from this survey module, all the data gets aggregated up um, and it gets organized by brand, by region, by coalition, um, and presented to leadership. So now a brand president has a true understanding of what's going on around their facilities. So whether you're Wrangler, the North Face, Timberland, you can see now a complete picture of What's your waste diversion rate? Um, how much, what's your energy and, and, and carbon and how are you um, progressing to goals? How many community service hours um, do you have? Um, a lot of different information in there. Then we can roll it up to a coalition or corporate level so we can start seeing on the aggregate. We can also start comparing one brand to the next or one region to the next. And we also bring in other indicators. Um, and so we have KPIs like energy per employee or energy per square foot or, you know, those kinds of things. We ask those types of questions and we merge data from other databases across the organization to really try and get a complete picture of what's going on in the organization. So business leaders can start to understand okay, if this is the information, how do I act on it? How have I been improving or not improving? And what's the benefit of that? You can also hover over, um, you can see kind of the, the facility, the map on the left. You can also start hovering over your regions and your sites to actually get real data and see what's actually driving that data. And so it's, it's really powerful information for not only the brand sustainability leaders, because we have brand sustainability leaders in most of our, our big brands, but also, again, the presidents and the executive teams to start understanding how we're doing across our portfolio so we can make better business decisions and we can start to see who is leading and who's lagging and not necessarily, um, you know, reprimanding anyone or anything like that, but seeing how can we help them. And if there is someone leading in, in, in waste um, management, then let's take those best practices that we found out in that survey and let's share them. So one example of that is with our distribution centers. So through this data, we started to see that the DCs um, were actually pretty good, maybe not surprisingly, but were pretty good at managing waste. And they were doing some really interesting, innovative things around it. So we decided as we thought about our waste goals and how we wanted to approach waste as an organization, let's focus in on distribution centers. They're really good at moving materials around and let's understand what they're doing. So what it is, it, that led to was over about two and a half years, we um, now have seven zero waste sites um, across the U.S. Europe is now embracing that and they're moving to some zero waste DCs and they are now tracking at about 88 to 89% waste diversion across all distribution centers. Um, and so we were able to kind of find those niches of, okay, where can we focus our attention, again, to create some momentum, create some wins, um, and to really start moving the organization forward. We've also been able to show that that saved a significant amount of money. Um, so that goes right to the ROI. We had no idea um, how much money we spent on, um, on tipping fees, on, you know, waste removal, how much we received in recycling reimbursements. We're now able to collect all that data and illustrate that actually when a site goes to zero waste, um, we're saving a significant amount of dollars and, oh, by the way, engaging our associates, creating great PR and all that other um, good value add that you can speak to. Um, yeah, that's, that's probably good. Um, so, so what does this all really kind of, you know, play out? It, it plays out really in the external communications piece. Um, we published our first sustainability and responsibility report in 2014, and that was a catalyzing moment, um, and it really helped catalyze the organization around 
what we wanted to say, what did we believe in, um, and where were we going. And that was a really important piece for the organization to, I think, really cement and maybe put a stake in the ground about what we are about, what our values are, where we're headed, and our commitment to being transparent and communicating um, our goals and our progress. Um, and we knew if we were going to do that, if we were going to put this report out there, we had to have a lot of back end work completed. Um, so I don't think it was necessarily the, you know, the tail wagging the dog. I think it was, again, a really important um, catalyzing moment to say, we're expected to report externally. Um, our, our, our employees expect it, our suppliers, our NGOs, media, you, know, you name it, expect it. And if we're going to do that, then we have to have all of this reporting buttoned up behind the scenes. And that was a really, really important piece. And, and in fact, our, you know, our, our, our CEO and chairman of the board, you know, recognized that, recognized the, the effort that it takes um, to do that and, and really pushed us and challenged us um, and was a firm believer and supporter of it. And um, that, that helps. <laughs> it always helps when um, the chairman and CEO has your back and they recognize the importance of doing that um, because, Reporting is, is, is tedious. Um, getting to this point um, is not easy. So starting, if you think about, you know, where we started um, five years ago, um, it was a blank slate. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, and getting to this point of externally communicating our progress of programs and as well as giving our leadership internal report cards um, with a lot of work, but it also, I think, has, has propelled our, our program and platform forward, helped us be more strategic in our work. Um, absolutely, I think it's gained us a lot of respect um, across the organization, and, and it's legitimized our efforts. Um, so, you know, we're, we're really thrilled at where we are today. We know we have a long, um, a long way to go still. But um, we're really thrilled with where we are, and I hope that each of you, no matter where you are in your journey, um, can, can leverage reporting um, because I think it can – actually, again, it's not the end-all, be-all goal, but I think it can really help you accomplish some of your own, your own goals. So. Leticia, yeah. thanks for that. Those, those are some, some really keen insights, and I think to your point, um, some really good, good thought provokers for the audience. Um, Romy as well, you know, both of you have been through quite a, uh, interesting journey as it relates to, uh, uh, kind of tackling this initiative, um, head on. So, um, remind everyone to, to posit some questions. I don't, I don't know that we'll have time to get, uh, to all of them here in just a few minutes that we have left. Um, but one that, that came in that I thought would be interesting perspective maybe for, for both of you, um, and it's around the topic of materiality. Um, and for those on the line not familiar with that, a materiality assessment or analysis is essentially a process that folks can go through um, where you solicit feedback and insights not only from internal um, constituents but also external groups to essentially rate what are the key areas that are material issues that are important to corporate disclosure and corporate reporting. So, for example, depending on various businesses, you may or may not have sensitivity to food um, uh, availability or ecosystem components or energy data or whatever it may be. And so it's essentially a process to go through to analyze what are the most material impacts to then really kind of focus and hone in on your, your reporting area. So, um, uh, Letitia, maybe, maybe starting with you, just a, a, a quick context of, around, you know, how have you or if you have used materiality and how did that help shape the reporting program? And then Romy, interested in your perspective as well. Sure. Well, we took uh, materiality from kind of two perspectives. One was on um, external, right, so getting the um, external stakeholders um, to give us their perspective, and we've done that a number of times, and it's been incredibly helpful. But um, also really look internally and think about what really can we have impact in in the short and long term. 
and that's really important, is your operational control. So there's some things that'll come up in a materiality assessment from external stakeholders. And yes, it's absolutely critical and important, but, but um, do you have much control over that and can you make an impact in it? Um, that's the questions you have to ask. And when we kind of go out and survey um, and do some data analysis, um, we recognize that there are other opportunities for us to really move the needle. And I think you have to balance that between um, kind of the internal and external perspective. Um, so that would just be kind of, you know, something that we've really kind of gained, you know, better insight into. Um, and just being really realistic of um, what you can and can't do. Um, so, you know, what I say a lot in terms of kind of materiality is, um, incremental changes on large scale can be transformative. And that's kind of how we think about things at VF is, you know, some of the things that we do might not seem to be really big on a one-off, but when we do it across our whole entire company, that's really where we move, we move the needle. And that, that is material to our business and to the industry. Interesting. Romy, I'm, I'm kind of interested in your, your perspective on that as well, knowing that uh, obviously you had the Dow Jones Sustainability Index accomplishment and some of those. Have you all considered materiality at all or, or undertaken that? Yes, and just curious yes sure. If and uh, maybe coming back to reporting, um, I think you can publish a report without having done a materiality assessment. On the other hand, I really feel it, it's a really helpful process. Um, especially from a strategic point of view, because um, it's, it's really helping you to gain insight in what, for external stakeholders, um, and yeah, of course you have to list all your stakeholders, but what for them um, is important or not, uh, but also what uh, can be an opportunity or a risk for your company. And um, it can really bring some interesting discussions internally on what maybe is perceived as something very important internally. It's something that maybe externally is not having the highest priority and you find that you actually have a big gap in um, maybe being able to be transparent about certain policies on a subject that you don't consider are too big of a risk because you have it covered, but you're, yeah. So I think from a strategic point of view, uh, it's really helpful. And um, also um, to decide on your long-term sustainability strategy, it really helps you prioritize certain subjects over others and, and really uh, help you question yourself on what is really important for us as an organization and where can we actually have an impact. Yeah, and thinking about sort of the, the earlier poll question that sort of said just understanding the breadth of data to manage and how to collect it most efficiently yeah. being, you know, kind of a, a key challenge. It's connected to subject. So I think, yeah, through your materiality assessment, you can actually make a structure and then connect the relevant KPIs to, to those subjects. So it can actually help you to really uh, create overview of all this, this data that you think you have to be collecting to help them cluster it. Yeah, it certainly does. We've seen a lot of success in, in terms of thinking thinking about that. So great question from the audience. And unfortunately, I think based on our, our time, we want to be uh, uh, cognizant of that with the folks that have dialed in. So we um, received a number of other questions with the, which the Schneider team will be sure to kind of connect with everyone that kind of posed those back on. Um, this recording will be available, and I think we'll follow up with a, a link that allows you to access that. Um, um, and again, on behalf of, of Gabriel, um, Romy, Letitia, a sincere thank you for um, the time that you spent with us today and, and just sharing what I, what I felt to be really interesting best practices and insights with the audience and um, to help folks with, with propelling their reporting programs. So, so thank you very much. and. Uh, um, remember to rate us um, there on your webinar screen, and, and with that, um, we'll, we'll let you go about your day. And, and again, um, really pleased that you um, took the opportunity to join us. Thanks, and, and speak with you soon.